and we're waiting to learn the sentence of the very first January 6th rioter to go on trial here in D.C. Prosecutors asking for 15 years for Guy Reffitt, uh, a Texas militia member who stormed the Capitol armed with a gun and zip ties. This comes as sources are telling NBC News that the next round of January 6th hearings could we well be focusing on law enforcement failures. That includes the Secret Service leading up to the attack. Joining me now, NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian and Betsy Woodruff Swan, politics reporter and national correspondent for Politico. So, Ken, you're at the courthouse in Washington. What are you hearing from inside the court as this uh, trial, the sentencing, has progressed, I assume? It has, Andrew, though we have not heard a sentence yet. It's, this hearing is expected to go into the afternoon. But uh, Guy Reffitt's family, or some of his family, is on hand. His wife, speaking in his defense on the way into the courtroom. Um, his lawyers are saying that that request by the prosecutors for 15 years is absurd because they say he wasn't convicted of assaulting a police officer and he never entered the Capitol. So why are prosecutors trying to throw the book at Guy Reffitt? Well, they say that he didn't just want to come to the Capitol that day to stop the count of electoral votes. He actually had a plan to seize members of Congress, including Nancy Pelosi, and he boasted about wanting to drag her out of the Capitol by her ankles. He had a loaded gun holstered. Uh, he had brought a, an assault rifle to Washington, D.C. that day, but didn't bring it to the Capitol. And he, um, prosecutors say he played a role in encouraging uh, other fellow rioters to breach the west front of the Capitol, even though he didn't go in himself because he was pepper sprayed. And then afterwards, he tried to cover up his actions, they say, and showed absolutely no remorse, even after he was convicted at trial. And they say he threatened his children uh, who were uh, talking about turning him into the FBI. And in fact, his teenage son, Jackson Ruffett, testified against him at trial and wrote a letter that will be read in court today as a victim impact statement in this case. Uh, and as you mentioned, Andrea, this is the first case where prosecutors are seeking to apply a terrorism enhancement to the sentence. There is no crime of domestic terrorism, but they are accusing him of being a domestic terrorist and saying that the judge should sentence him to a longer period of incarceration because of that. Um, as I mentioned, sentencing hearing well underway, probably expected in the afternoon, Andrew. And just to look ahead to the January 6th committee's work, and a lot of staff work is going on during this recess in August before they have hearings in September, uh, what is the vulnerability of law enforcement agencies writ large? Because we did have those hearings that Senators Klobuchar and Blunt held just uh, a year ago, a little more than a year ago, on the law enforcement, the communications failures. What are they specifically looking at, do we think? So there's a, a part of the January 6th uh, inquiry called the Blue Team, which is focusing expressly on the law enforcement and intelligence failures. And you're absolutely right. That Senate inquiry did a fantastic job of getting to, of plumbing the depths of failure by the Capitol Police because they had access to all kinds of internal message traffic by the Capitol Police. But what they didn't have was internal traffic by the FBI. And there's still a lot of questions about the role of the FBI and the Secret Service and DHS, what information they had, why didn't they publish a joint intelligence bulletin? Why weren't they better prepared for that day? And that, we are told, our, my colleague Ryan Riley has reported, is going to be a subject of, a, of an upcoming hearing. Now, this doesn't really fit into the narrative uh, that you know, Liz Cheney and others have, have put forward uh, you know, in terms of uh, the Donald Trump conspiracy to overturn the election. But members of this committee, including former federal prosecutors who have been working on this, think that it's important to get this information out, to learn these lessons that, uh, of how a major domestic terrorism attack was able to unfold in the heart of our government, Andrew. Thanks to you, Ken Delanian and Betsy Woodruff Swan. The Washington Post has some reporting. I just want to read uh, to everyone about this hunt for the missing Secret Service text messages, uh, which Zoe Lofgren and others flagged last week was going to be a prime issue for them. The Department of Homeland Security's chief watchdog scrapped its investigative team's effort to collect agency phones to try to recover deleted Secret Service texts this year. And if you look toward the end of this timeline, you see that in February of this year, the IG's office prepared efforts to retrieve the text, but then decided against it the same month. The Post citing multiple sources, government whistleblowers in its reporting. They certainly didn't flag it at all uh, early enough to the January 6th committee. Betsy? 
Yeah, it's just bizarre. And at the bare minimum, assuming the most benign possible explanations for all this uh, really, really unusual and bizarre behavior, even the most benign explanation is deeply and acutely embarrassing for the Department of Homeland Security. This department, of course, was stood up in the wake of 9-11 and has tried to position itself as the lead arm of the federal government on cybersecurity issues. This is one of the things that they view at the headquarters level as a core part of their mission set. So the fact that DHS and one of its most prized components, the Secret Service, can't seem to engage in the basic blocking and tackling of message retention just looks really, really calamitous frankly. And now, in addition, the fact that the inspector general, the department's internal watchdog, has had his investigation progress and then apparently stop progressing along such an unusual timeline only heightens the level of external concern that members of Congress have about the way that this has all played out. Any time inspector general's offices fail to do their jobs properly, it's super concerning to Congress. Those inspector generals exist throughout the federal government because they have the resources and the subject matter expertise to do what Congress can't always do. So when things play out the way they have here, the Hill finds it very disturbing. And Betsy, you have your own exclusive reporting in Politico today on the DOJ's January 6th investigation saying a Republican National Committee election integrity official is appearing in agency subpoenas. What more can you tell us? That's right. In at least three subpoenas to witnesses in Arizona and Georgia, there's a person named whose communications DOJ is seeking. That person is named Joshua Findlay. During the campaign and at the time when the alternate electors scheme was playing out, Finley worked on the Trump campaign's internal legal office. After Biden was inaugurated, Finley went over to the Republican National Committee, the RNC, to take over as, as a, a post titled National Director of Election Integrity. This is something that was a huge priority for the RNC as they tried to simultaneously, uh, at least from an optics perspective, vaguely distance themselves from the Stop the Steal extremism, the January sixth extremism, but at the same time, court the enormous portion of the Republican base that believed the election had been stolen. The subpoenas seek communications to and from Joshua Finley up until the date when the witnesses received them, which means it's possible that those subpoenas could capture not just communications that Finley had or received related to January 6th, but also communications related to his work at the RNC. And that is so interesting. Thank you so much, Betsy Woodruff-Swan, and of course our thanks to Ken Delanian.